Hello, everyone, and welcome to Access Ability in the Writer's Room. Uh, I'm Daniela Sione, and I run uh, some screenwriting programs in Canada that are international. And I thought um, it was due time to talk to some of my students and alumni who are working writers with disabilities. And I know we can't represent every single disability on one panel. Um, I just read a statistic that 20% of Canadians are living with a disability. Uh, so it's actually quite a broad spectrum. And um, so obviously people are going to speak from their own experiences, from their own lens. I have uh, no disabilities yet. <laughs> it can happen, of course, to any of us at any time. But cer certainly I will be uh, seeing the world through my ableist lens. So if there's any, you know, just call me out if if I say something or, or have an opinion that is, you know, because I'm not living in your shoes right now, but I do hope that we can raise understanding for each other to be better allies and to specifically deal with uh, what you guys deal with as writers in terms of issues of representation and access. And I really just uh, think you guys are also great uh, creative talent. So I, I also always wanna shine a spotlight um, on that as well. Um, not just about the disability, but, but you guys have unique perspectives that will help us um, understand more how we can become uh, a better industry. Before we start, I want us all to introduce ourselves also with a visual description of our frame in case anyone with visual impairments is tuning in. Um, I'll start with myself. I'm Daniela and I am wearing a blue dress. I am Italian Canadian sitting in my living room um, with a uh, in my condo in Toronto. Uh, and uh, I'll leave most of the biographical stuff about what people do to the panelists. Ali, why don't you go next? Uh, hi, my name is Ali, and I am a white woman with long dark hair, and uh, I'm sitting here in a, a black t-shirt with a sort of grayscale cardigan on, and my background is a cozy li library with a fireplace because I wish I was in a cozy library with a fireplace right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a writer, and I'm a story editor, and I'm also an educator and facilitator through uh, for employment supports for people with disabilities and specifically training in digital media and accessible content creation. Oh, amazing. And Veronica. As Daniela said, with her little pigtails and her big pink glasses. Uh, my name is Veronica Swartz. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I have long, bright red hair, like Ariel. I'm a little mermaid. I have blue eyes light skin, a little bit of freckles. I'm wearing gigantic silver snowflake earrings and a black sequin top with a gold zipper. And behind me is a white door with a leopard print uh, cape that I like to remind myself that I have, that I bought. <laughs> and, Do you want to talk uh, about what you like to write? Uh, sure. I I like to write comedy, but <laughs> I started out. I guess uh, I started out writing. Uh, I wrote a show for the Rhubarb Festival, and before that, I did other things. But I guess that would be the most notable, and um. Now I am a contributor to the Beaverton and I have a film, film development with CBC and we'll talk about that later with CBC yeah. Access. Yeah. Great. And Morgan Fry. Oh, nailed it. The last name. I'm, um, I'm Morgan. I'm white. I've got long brown hair. I have glasses. I'm wearing a pink plaid shirt. Behind me are all of my sister's accomplishments. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, I I don't know. I oh I'm a I'm a comedian and I I write and I'm a playwright and yeah mainly theater's kind of been my world but that's yeah. 
And um, uh, Ali has been in my TV writing program and my story editing program. And I think Ali is exceptional as, especially as a story editor, if you are looking for one, but also as a writer. Um, and uh, Morgan and Veronica are, have both trained with me in television and feature film. And they're also excellent. They're, they're, I, I'm just so uh, lucky that, that students uh, like these find me because um, I just consider myself very lucky, as you'll see uh, as we get to know them. Um, okay, thank you so much. So first, I wanted to sort of start from outside the writer's room and work our way closer and closer to it. Um, from outside the writer's room as an audience, I'm always amazed actually by the three of you, how much uh, like pop culture knowledge and television and film knowledge you have, like more than I have. Um, do you have any sort of... Uh, Mm, uh, opinions about how uh, the disabled of uh, various disabilities are handled in current uh, film and TV, uh, uh, like it, as it exists today? Um, I don't think they're handled that well, personally. Um, you know, I have, I have the questions so I can like see, um, but I don't like, there's this, one TV show called Speechless, um, which was about a family and um, their son has cerebral palsy. Mini Driver was in it. And that was like the best, in my opinion, executed version of any disability thing because it they hired somebody who had cerebral palsy. And it was just like, watch. I watched it with my mom and we, a lot of what they were going through is what we had to go through kind of with me. And like, like I'm a, I'm a multiple amputee, um, but just like some of their storylines were similar to like um, our family. And so it was, that was the best I've seen. It's kind of nice when I watch TV shows and people pop up and they they are an amputee or something like that. But whenever I watch something and there is a disabled person, I automatically am like, are they in this chair? They better be in that chair. And I like immediately start searching because it, it's still something people have a hard time uh, grasping that, you know, they should maybe hire people. I don't know, it's not, uh, am I, opinion is not done well but sometimes sometimes it's done and yeah I don't know. Oh, and, and by the way, Morgan and Veronica are also both performers. So if you can also want to, if you want to speak through a performer's lens besides the writer's lens, that is totally welcome, of course. Yeah. I think uh, when it comes to representation for all of us is that we're all different. Mm -hmm. And um, so like access within that is uh, different. Like it, all of us need something different. Yes. And um, sorry, I'm like, I'm so focused on access right now. Like that's all Oh yeah, no, we're, we're gonna talk about access a hundred percent. I just wanted to, to start wide and go deeper and, you know, I, I don't know, that's just me, but we will yeah. talk about yeah. access. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm doing my thing and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> they actually can't think of a show who has a deaf lead. Is there one? Do you guys know of one? Uh, yeah, well, Hawkeye. Hawkeye? Okay. I don't know that one. Um, there are others, though. There are, like, scattered. Uh, the Walking Dead has um, oh. a deaf character. I, know, <laughs> I wonder, like, how I would do post-apocalypse, like, I have like rechargeable hearing aids like I won't be able to recharge them um, <laughs> that's yeah. hilarious did they did they address that in the walking dead <laughs> no no well and and that's the thing it's like uh, my old ones had uh had regular batteries and my <laughs> you know the movie uh oh what was the movie? The horror movie? I think it was the uh, Quiet Place that you're talking about. Yeah, is it? Yeah, a Quiet. Place. And so when I first met my my hearing doctor here in Calgary, uh, I was like, "So what did you think of the Quiet Place?" And she's like, uh, "No one with implants has feedback." <laughs> and if if you saw the movie, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> But my old hearing aids have feedback. Like, yeah. Okay. Anyway. 
Awesome. Awesome. You know, because I do know of there's a couple of shows with blind leads, whether or not the actors are actually blind is different. That's a different conversation. But they and I know those shows made efforts to have um, and have some blind writers in the writing room. But things like like that about the hearing aids would would have been, you know, addressed if that was the case. Ali, what do you think? Um, you know, I thought a lot about this because I yeah. saw the question that you asked and and there I think I agree with Morgan in that there's not a whole lot of really good representation out there and speechless was definitely uh, in the top for me. But what I found is like a lot of the stuff I like that's doing representation really well is in comedy and like, you know me, Danielle, I'm not really a comedy person. Um, but so like speechless was really good. Um, special was really good. Special had particular jokes that only work if you have cerebral palsy. And I absolutely love that. Um, there was uh, everything's going to be okay did excellent representation um it was like there was something about like the sister had uh was autistic but also went to a school like had a special classroom full of people who were autistic and all of those people actually were uh autistic and they they were involved in the creation process of those characters which was fantastic and um, it was just a really warm and heartfelt show that wasn't centered around her autism. It was centered around his, like the main characters, uh, adjusting to his new family life and, and the, the dynamic between the three siblings. It was really nice. And I think part of the reason that I really like comedy in this space when we talk about disability rep is that like a lot of the representation we get when we get it is drama about how sad it is to be disabled or to have a disabled family member and to adjust to that. So I love disabled joy and I love uh, neurodivergent joy. And you get that with comedy, but I also really like, like what's happening in the genre space mm -hmm. with disability. Like I like, Mike Flanagan is not himself disabled, but he's saying and doing a lot of really interesting, not disabled centered stories, but stuff that is, uh, can be seen through a disabled lens more disability rep in the new seasons of Doctor Who that are upcoming, which I'm very excited about because I'm a giant Doctor Who nerd. <laughs> so like, I think that change is coming that I'm really looking forward to, but I don't think we're getting it right yet. In class, you did bring this up. You're like, I don't want to write something about a sad <laughs> person. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on, on like some of the tropes and stereotypes you've seen with previous representation that, that really irk you as a viewer. I mean, yeah, I like I I try my best not to um like watch anything that has an able-bodied person playing someone with a disability, um just because I don't I sometimes it's hard because it's like there's one show Superstore, um which I think is funny, but he's not in a wheel and I almost didn't watch it, but I had I, I did a lot of research first <laughs> to like I really wanted to watch it, um but just like all those. What's that one? I don't know. You before me, me before you. That whatever that one. And he's just like, I don't know. But he gets, he he's like paraplegic, and then he's like super sad, and he like just wants to die because this is his, he was this like rich guy. I didn't really watch it. This is all I'm gaining from the trailer. Um, but he like wants to die because now he's disabled, and then like his young hot whatever is helping him like caretakers and, but and it's always like find the way of life. I don't know some crap like that, and it's just it's those people with, in my in my opinion my experience people with disabilities are seen as objects instead of humans mm -hmm. so um where people I feel like writing able-bodied people writing people for people with disabilities are just taking it based off of what they've seen in other things and like oh so this is how they're mm -hmm. disabled so they must be so sad about their situation so they probably just want to like die and that like but we're going to make it uplifting because um we're seen as making you or not you guys but able-bodied people feel better about themselves and it's like if like if you have to compare yourself to somebody with a disability like that's really sad <laughs> like you have the worst life if that's what you're doing you know what I mean like yeah. so yeah and that's like for me it's so hard because it's this balance of I don't want to write something where like you know oh she's sad about her disability like she must hate it and everything right so it makes it harder for me to write those moments where like the one the movie that I am working on 
like it's hard for me to have her sit in those moments because I don't want people to think yeah she's gonna really like she must hate it she must you know what I mean it's just it's, I think it's just society's you know views on it's also kind of clouding my judgment yeah. but that's kind of like I don't know that's just how I feel it's you know we're either a huge inspiration and we're a hero and that's the whole purpose or like we're sad and we want to die and here are your movies and it's like oh like <laughs> Oh, I, and I love, she's, uh, Morgan writes family, you tend to write family drama yeah, and, yeah. and uh, shows, and um, she's writing yeah. a love story. She's writing a teenage sort of heartbreak teenage story. It's, I don't yeah. really, she happens uh, to have a disability, but, yeah. uh, but it's, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, we were talking about this in class today too, sometimes because we work from character the character work is want need flaw yeah. symptom of the flaw and uh I've, I've had classes where people indicate a disability or a neurological disability as the flaw i mean they're both disabilities but yeah i was like uh that's not a flaw <laughs> that is a trait that yeah. can be positive or negative in different situations but uh, the flaw is an emotional human thing that we're grappling with I'll have the same flaw if I if I am disabled tomorrow I'll be grappling with my same psychological issues there's maybe more obstacles there may be more ways that I cope but but yeah so um you talked about some of the standout shows that are doing it well so Hawkeye everything's going to be okay speechless special um what about Crip Camp I haven't seen that I keep hearing good things about it has anyone seen it? That's a documentary. Okay, that's not oh, it's a documentary. documentary. But it is amazing and we should watch it because okay. everybody <laughs> here should watch it because it is amazing. And it is the first time I saw footage of the Capitol Crawl that made me jump up and cheer. Oh, <laughs> like it was just so it was absolutely cheesy the way that it was edited and done, but it was we deserved that kind of cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So have any of you ever brought so they call it sensitivity reads, but like basically bringing someone in from a community when a character is representing someone of that community. Have you guys ever been asked to do that? If so, how do you handle it? And how do you feel about this sort of? <laughs> I see Ali. Um, um, Ali, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, I don't want to go first, but yes, I have had these experiences. <laughs> oh, awesome. Oh, great, great. Um, and uh, in terms of advice, I don't really have any advice because um, when I do it, it does not go well. <laughs> um, sometimes it does not go well for me. Other times it does not go well for them. Um, so I, the first film that I ever got credited on was somebody called a friend of mine called me up she says there's this guy he wants to produce a short with me he wants it to be about autism i don't know anyone with autism you know lots and lots of people would you like to write this and i said sure absolutely and i wrote the script and then he was not happy with the script because he said he wanted it to be more about the he wanted the same thing he wanted it to be from the perspective of the parents and how difficult it was for the parents to have an autistic child. And I was like, you cannot ask a neurodivergent writer to write how awful it must have been to parent me. Please, <laughs> you. <laughs> like, you cannot ask that of me. You have, you have hired the wrong person for this job. Um, and so they made a bunch of changes to it, but it's still my name on it. And that was really hard for me mm. for a while. And it was kind of like, in some ways it was good because from that second, I was like, all right, so I have two choices. I can either write the stuff that is talking to my people and talking to my audience, or I can explain disability to able-bodied neurotypicals for the rest of my life. <laughs> that is a choice I have to make. And I have to make it right now at the beginning so that I never have to make it again. <laughs> and um, I'm going with my people. <laughs> Great. so in a way that was kind of that was sort of empowering but yeah it, and it does happen like I get people like can you better read that can you read this for sensitivity points can you tell me what needs to be done and I'm and I do have to ask them like do you have disabled writers do you expect me are you going to treat me as a writer or do you just want ideas because um I think as Veronica had mentioned there's a lot of us and we all have our own like there's different, there are different, not just in terms of challenges and in terms of needs of access, but we all have our own ideas of it because we are people. 
we all have our own uh, histories and ideas and the intersecting identities that feed into the, the ableism that we're all living with and the things that we all experience that are the same. So I always ask people like, how much work have you already done? Am I the first person you're going to talk to about this? Am I the only person you're going to talk? And honestly, who's your audience for this? Because I can't write for, for able-bodied neurotypicals. I've tried, I'm bad at it. <laughs> you're great. Well, your scripts resonate with me. <laughs> No, they're, you're a very good writer. Do you, um, since you took, this is just a side question for me because you, you took the story editing program and, and we do that whole thing about pre-interviewing your client. Has that helped you in this regard? Because I think that's super important for whatever the case may be, whatever you write uh, that you, that because that sounds like it's even more necessary in this case. Yeah, I think, I think it does because, and the other thing is, is I, I do advise other people, like don't take a thing that says consultant, disability consultant because they are there to mine you for your experiences. That's what a consultant is. And it's just not, it, it's not good for us and it's not good for your art. And, uh, and I think that, yeah, those questions absolutely do help because I do, it, it helps people to hone in on audience. And one of the, like, there's a lot of people trying to write things that will resonate with um, an equity seeking audience now because we don't have, we haven't had that in the past. Uh, so there's a lot of people who are trying to get at those stories that they, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, don't have access to. <laughs> and um, so in order to sort of be, be authentic about it, you do have to ask those questions about like, what other work are you trying to do? And the biggest thing is you're bringing in an audience that you're not ready for. When, if you're writing these stories from an experience that you don't actually have, you're bringing in an audience that you are not necessarily ready for because so many of us are starved for content featuring us. So we're gonna be paying attention to whatever it is that you're writing. Amazing, so, so yes. And so would you, say it's, would you say it's fair to say not to just have you, have you be a beta reader or sensitivity reader, but you could actually literally hire you as a writer or as a story editor. Like yeah, and that, who has and now because i've taken the class and because i've you know all of the things that we've talked about that is something that i do is, is they say hey well i would like you to to read for this and give me to no you need to hire me yeah unless you have another disabled writer in mind and if this is the story you're going to tell you need to hire me <laughs> good yeah as as you should you you are there you're you are there i've never been hired as a as a reader um but i want to say that the deaf characters that I like are not deaf. Like, uh, sorry, um, their purpose for being in a script yeah. is not about them being deaf, and that's and that's what I want. And we talked about this before, and I told you uh, that people just want like they don't just want writers with disabilities; they want. Um, stories with disabilities and I'm like eh, you that know is, that is totally what we're going to dive into next I just want to make sure uh I want to ask Morgan if she's ever been asked to be a sensitivity reader my friend was reading a script and she asked me um so it wasn't like a direct thing but she was like I'm reading the script this guy gets injured and he says like something like I think I think it was they wrote gimp I think and I was like like, I don't want to be like, a, I don't know. It was something like that. And I said, well, what year is the set in? Because if it's in like the 40s or something, <laughs> as awful as it is, that's what was used. And she's like, no, it's present day. And I said, well, you know, Crippled's not great either, but it's still not as offensive as that. Like, you know, he could just say, I don't want to be injured. But like, it was some, I forget, like, I didn't, she didn't tell me totally the whole thing, but it was, it was that. And I was like, and she's like, I didn't think it was okay, but I thought I should ask you because I figured you would know more. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do want to dive into this uh, with all of you. 
How, do you feel, because when I was interviewing some of my uh, BIPOC uh, alumni, they said that they felt this pressure from the industry to write about their bipoc nest, to, be, to write about their race, which they didn't necessarily want to focus on that. They just would like to write characters who represent them, who are living their lives, right? Rather than having stories about race. So V, do you want to start start on, uh, be the first to answer that one about, do you feel a pressure to write about, in your case, your deafness? Well, yeah, like I said, like it's um, like it's not enough to just be a disabled person in the industry. You know what I mean? Like they're finally opening themselves up to us, which is great. Um, they found out uh, one of the unions last year. Was it last year? Can't remember what union did this, but they found out that less than one percent of people working in the TV and film industry have disabilities. That is the WGA found that out last year. The Writers Guild. Oh, of okay. Canada. Yeah. Okay. So they started reaching out after that, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it seems like, like it's not enough. Like I have to add, like I've written so many things now and now I have to add me having a disability for them to get interested you know the queer stuff you've written like that's the stuff that excites me about your writing that I hope you keep going in that direction um not not to say that you can't have a deaf character or whatever but you haven't actually in the in the scripts in most of the scripts that you've written so far and they're they're just really good and really specific to queerness which is like that in and of itself is like, oh, I really want to see that. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt if if there are characters with disabilities in it, but that's not what makes your particular voice as it's been growing out of your own history as a burlesque performer, right? Yeah, and I mean, I, can, I write jokes about being deaf till the yeah. cows come home, like, and I do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to listen to men anymore. That's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, it, that's not all that I am and that's not necessarily who I am as a writer I was writing before I started losing my hearing I was writing before I knew as neurodivergent like <clears throat> I had no idea so like like I just want to write and yeah like, like, you know yeah I don't I don't I, and that's and that's why I was saying like that's why I really loved Hawkeye, they're deaf characters in that show. They were great. And, um, but it wasn't like the biggest part of that show, you know? It was just two they were. How, how, how about you, Morgan? Do you feel a pressure? Because I know some of what you've yes. written does feature disabled characters, and most of it does really, but like, yeah. do you feel pressure to do that? Um, yeah. Like, when I was going to school and doing like comedy, my teacher was like, you need to do more jokes about your disability. And I was like, but like, no, thanks. Like, it's not, it's not about that. And, and that's, yeah, I feel like sometimes I have to just because as, as an amputee, oftentimes we're not represented, other disabilities are. And like, obviously that's fantastic. But then it's also like, I don't want to be the one that has to like, and he, you know what I mean? Like the Joan of Arc of, you know, disabled people, like uh, amputees, right? Like, I don't want to be like that person. But so sometimes I feel pressure, like with my, with my movie, I, that purposely, I was like, I want to write this. Like, it will be like a disabled movie, but it's like a teen romance thing. Um, but other times, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, well, do I have to put disabilities in here? Like, like I want to play this role, but I don't want to write her as, you know, disabled. So it, like, it just, it's a whole hoo-ha. <laughs> but again, it just, again, it's not seeing the amputee representation. And like, for me, like I said, I'm, I'm multiple. I'm missing both my feet and my right hand. So it's often you just see someone missing a leg or not. not so that's not a big deal because that is, <laughs> but, but, or like they're missing a hand and like, for me, I'm I'm missing a lot, so it it also is kind of yeah that pressure of like there isn't someone that's a multiple amputee and like what's that like so oh I should probably but I, yeah it's, yeah 
Uh, I in comedy class, if it was a stand up teacher, there's a thing in stand up, as you probably know, where like the audience sees you and you have to call out what they see. Mm -hmm. and, and it's part of soothing the audience. Right. Which is in film and television. We, we kind of have to do yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah. And like that, I understood, obviously. Right. You kind of have to like address it. But then he was like the, all the other sets and everything. should, And it's like, no, nothing. Like I wrote a one woman show and it is all about that. Um, but, but like, it took I think Morgan, if I can cut you off, Daniela, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I want to talk to you more, definitely. But I, I think what we need to do is just like call attention to it, right towards it, and then we can do whatever the hell we want after. Like that, they'll buy, they'll buy whatever we're talking about. And then we can right where we want after that's what I'm thinking the more we were talking about it anyway yeah yeah no no cool I know you did that in your stand-up too like you would start um uh, with addressing it and you may or may not do the do more jokes about deafness but you definitely uh you address it in the stand-up briefly and then <laughs> and then move on um and Ali do you want to say anything about this do you feel pressure <laughs> You, you um, want to write about disability. I do, but yeah, a lot, there is, it's a weird sort of thing because I think that I spent a lot of years before all of this talk about diversity and before all of that stuff, I spent a lot of years consciously not writing disability because I was always being told the only reason to do that is if the story is about disability, which it is not. And um, so flipping that switch has been a little difficult. So I, I know I said at the beginning of the panel, Daniela, a lot of the stuff that I'm writing now is dealing with the internal ableism that is caused by all of that. Um, and you do, I, I feel for Morgan so much because you do feel that pressure of like, I would have needed this. So it is needed and I wanted to exist and I'm here and I should do it. Um, but also I don't wanna do that. I wanna write this other thing over here. And so I do feel the pressure in some ways. Um, and also, um, I you kind of grow up when you grow up with a disability you grow up with the idea that that is what is interesting about you and huh. you have to defend that and it's it's not but also it is a math like I just said I'm not great at writing for able-bodied neurotypicals if you're along for the ride that's awesome and I'm glad you're getting something out of it but um this is coming out of my head and my head works this way and my experiences are this. And so my stories are gonna be disabled whether they have disability or not. And having to hold your hand and explain that to you is gonna get awkward for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's so, I mean, it's it's interesting because Ali, you, you do, you, you always said, I'm not a comedy writer, but you're very funny. <laughs> like you're just very funny in your one hour. <laughs> How do you feel about, access to the industry? Do you feel um, any impediments because of your disability specifically? Or I know the industry is already like really a hard nut to crack as it is. But um, uh, V, I know you really want to talk about this. So so let's start with you. <laughs> oh, fine. I get stuck. Okay. Um, yeah, when we talk about access for people with disabilities, um, it's different than access in general, like we all need specific things for it to be accessible. And like with disability on the whole, like every, every kind of disability needs their own access, but even within that, they need their own specific, like it, it's just, it has to be catered to the individual. And they have to stop making such a huge deal out of it. <laughs> Please and thank you. Yes, there's, I, I was uh, talking to someone neurodivergent about even just the use of the word accommodations, which is in the Disability Act, making accommodations in the workplace. Is that an offensive term? She was like, don't even use that word because it's like you're doing us a favor, but it's actually just making a level playing field for everybody. Is, uh, is that an accurate way to think about it? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's really frustrating. And it's frustrating how they call you out. Like, look what we did for you. Like, right. Mm -hmm, great. Thanks. You uh, passed the test on being a decent human being. <laughs> um, but like, 
Yeah. But in terms it's, it's of access, it's really frustrating. In terms of access to the writer, because we'll talk about access within the writer's room, but access to the writer's room, do you feel there's like extra barriers because of disability or or for there's many well, reasons? For me, you don't um, I can't, and again, you know, I can't speak for everyone and I'll shut up after this, uh, <laughs> but I get to talk now. So I'm going to talk. Um, but uh, like the way into uh, TV writer's rooms involves note taking. And I, unless there's a lot of accommodations, I can't do it. And oh, I thought of what I was going to say. So I talked about this. And so, you know, I've attended a lot of these. This is where some have been on the panel, but every single time, I've been like, hey, as a disabled person, and like most of these people know me, but like as a disabled person, how do I get in? Like, what? Do you know any other disabled people? Like, and they don't every single time. And what one of our friends said uh, was, oh, yeah, Veronica, you're probably better off just getting your own show. <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah. happen to agree with that. I actually think that's a fact. No, they said that in a friggin', they said that in a panel. Yeah. Like, and I'm like, hmm. yeah, I, you're right. I am better off. <laughs> No, no, it's it's actually true because you've advanced beyond an entry level position as a writer. So, so Veronica, specifically speaking to the story coordinator, the script coordinator, which is a, it's just an entry level job into the writer's room, and it's an opportunity that people can sometimes it's it's sometimes a way to get access to the writer's room. But um, I actually tell everybody this: if you can get in creating your own show, you're better off. Than working your way up through, so, but because of the the demands, the is actual everyone hearing this, is everyone seeing this right now. But you see what I mean, like, I, like... yeah, yeah. No, no, that's true for every. But but I see what. But I understand what you're saying. It's actually not an opportunity that's even probably a possibility for you because note taking is so huge because people are talking on top of each other really quickly in a writer's room like just that physical fact will automatically bias people towards your ability to keep up with that yeah but but it is I mean I say that to everybody like everybody because uh because of the way that I like to train you guys to be creators right that's my own bias as a teacher uh and, and it's it I don't say that as your disability but it, as a matter of of fact and bias I actually think it's it's an easier way for you to get to get in a writer's room you specifically but I, I my hope is that for everybody um because I try for for everybody to um to write work that is so personal to them that they get noticed and that's that's always been the way I teach but yeah I I I, I, and, that's, I and that's a messed up thing for us right it's like it, it's such a hard industry to get into and like yeah. we have to fight against um our own abilities and prejudice and everything on top of that it's yes yeah like, well are you sure you want to do this <laughs> Oh well, I yes, hope I, you, I, I hope you want to do it. Uh, um, I do. Uh, yeah. So there's the the that is, so that is definitely an avenue that that um, the story coordinator position is not one that is uh, easily easily would easily come to you specifically, which I understand that is a that is a real barrier. <laughs> uh, do you guys experience barriers in any other way? how about tokenism like not it, there's not even tokenism it's not like every writer's room has one disabled i mean they probably there's invisible disability and there's neuro, neuro atypical which i i believe hopefully <laughs> that is something that uh showrunners take into account um but there's not even tokenism because I, I i don't even think there's room you know that every room has one person with a disability necessarily as an active conscious thing that the showrunner is doing unless they're working on a show specifically with a disabled character. I don't know. Do you guys feel that? Even or do you then, think it's, yeah, go ahead, Ali. Even then they really don't. Like a lot of these shows that feature us, they don't hire uh, disabled actors. They don't hire disabled writers. Or they'll have one write, uh, disabled writer on the team mid-season, season two or 
whatever because they suddenly need that because they realize they've run out of stories about the sad disabled person. <laughs> um, this is a pattern that I've seen a million times and, and yeah, I'm a bit angry about it, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, this is a pattern I've seen a bunch. Of, it's very frustrating. And yeah, the numbers that I've crunched say that less than 1% of people behind the scenes of film and television are disabled less than one percent across the board and that's not in canada that's everywhere so wow. no there there's not there's not even tokenism they can't count how low those numbers are oh wow well it, it well when you consider that 20 percent, I, I i looked up the statistic just out of curiosity 20 percent of canadians have a disability that's not representation if less well, than one percent and yeah. even 20 percent of, of canadians that's a low mark because um there's invisible disabilities, there's issues getting diagnosed. I'm multiply neurodiverse. The, the word you were looking for, Daniela, was yeah. neurodiverse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm multiply neurodiverse um, because I'm currently in the process of getting my ADHD diagnosis and massive wait lists and massive hurdles and all of this stuff. So do you think 20% is the people with disabilities that we know of? That's not the estimated number. So yeah. Representation is effectively non-existent in oh. the industry. And everything in this industry is built for people to not succeed. Like everything between the long hours and the scheduling and the, you know, the financial stuff where, you know, you're working for three months a year and then you're not working and then you're working again. Though all of that makes it difficult to be in the this industry. Now compound that by the um, all of the physical challenges and health challenges that a person with a disability has to face. The fact that they're going to, they are going to be the only person in that room who has to do any of that. The fact that everybody, all of the ableism that people believe about that person, should that person not be able to do something, you know, all of that stuff, all of those are barriers that we have. Not including the poverty and the, and the lack of access to education and all the rest of that stuff. Morgan, do you have anything to add? Um, not, well, I think just like I said before, just because we are kind of seen as objects instead of humans, that we're, we're taught that we have to explain ourselves and fit in with, with able-bodied people, but no one really teaches you guys how to fit in with us. Yeah. So then it gets really awkward and it gets kind of scary to kind of ask like hey I need this or is it because you don't want to ask because oh no you know what I mean there's the, I'm, I'm disabled and I don't want to you know make them think oh no well we can't have her back or we can't have that you know what I mean it's just it's a whole um yeah it's just a whole spirally kind of thing too right on top of everything else um that we go through just to get a job in a writer's room, <laughs> just to get to that place, you then have to be the, excuse me, I also need this. And it's, you know, it's the law that we have to accommodate, you know, I'm sorry, there's that word again, that we have to uh, make space <laughs> and make, you know, and all of that. Uh, and, and you, you still don't want to be seen as the person who's making trouble. How can the showrunner be your ally? How can your fellow writers be your ally? Um, how can people, um, just like Veronica said, be decent human beings <laughs> and and make it a level playing field for everybody in the room? Honestly, I think it goes back to that thing that you were saying about how we have all, all of this other stuff, the same stuff that you have, and then you have more stuff. So please, if you're cast, if you're putting a person with a disability in your room, don't make them be an advocate on top of that. Like, don't make them constantly ask for their needs to be met. Uh, you know that you're hiring a disabled person. There's a, an ongoing myth about people asking for special treatment because they're disabled. And it's really pervasive. And a lot of people don't know that they still believe that even when I'm sitting right in front of them. So like trust your disabled talent is telling you the truth about what they need and then just give it to them or be honest about what you can and cannot do. Don't stop worrying about getting sued if you cannot meet their needs. Stop <laughs> worrying about, are they, are they trying to rip me off? Are they trying to get me more than they actually need? Stop asking us to be an advocate in that room. For me personally, I've just been so used to fitting into the able-bodied world that I forget that I, I can ask for things. Um, 
And a lot of my friends have to remind me, they're like, no offense, like you're disabled, ask for, cause I'll be like carrying a bunch of stuff. And they're like, can we help you? Like, are you okay? And I'm like, I got it guys. And they're like, you can ask cause you're disabled. And it's like, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's, I, I just think like, yeah, like they were saying, don't make it obvious that you're like targeting that one, per like singling out that one person, like, da -da, and hey, you, do you need blah, blah, blah? It's like, you know what I mean? Just kind of, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, the, Bruce Horak told me an amazing story. He's he's a legally blind actor. He's got 9% vision in one eye. I interviewed him. He was an actor on Star Trek, Brave New Worlds. And he was telling me that he got to set, didn't ask, he hadn't, he hadn't like made any plans in ahead. And, and he said there was an assistant waiting for him to escort him through set, which can be a very dangerous place uh, because there's wires and there's like every kind of trip hazard for anybody. It's, it's, it's not an easy place to navigate. And he's like, the assistant was standing by, they were with me all day. People would identify themselves when they spoke to me. It was just, it, I didn't have to ask for it. It just happened. And that's Star Trek with a big budget. And obviously like, uh, you know, they care <laughs> about about their talent um uh but that doesn't that's something that wouldn't have been hard to do even on a lower budget even if a, a production assistant who worked there was assigned you know for what whatever I thought that was really really cool to hear um uh because I never got to work with him on set so yeah if there's anything like that we can do Veronica what do you think <laughs> uh if people could just make the world so that we could live in it that would be great thanks <laughs> uh yeah fair 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 enough um awesome do you guys want to talk about anything we haven't talked about yet if i can just say um just back to like hiring you know people are hiring able-bodied people to play um and that's like casting obviously is in charge of that and a big issue but I also kind of think again just my opinion that is also the responsibility of the actor to say something um because I know like Brian Cranston defended playing a disabled character in his one movie um that came out a couple of years ago and it was <laughs> not a good look for him and everyone kind of forgets that he did that um but he was saying that like he he said how it's hard because people just like people with disabilities need to get hired, um, but a like business decision was made to hire him instead because people with disabilities aren't well known. And it's like, right, because people like you just acknowledge that there's an issue and then decided to do absolutely nothing about it. Where if he had said, why don't we blah, 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 he would have looked like a hero. So I just, I think it's not just casting. I think like actors need to be aware that like, okay, I, they've asked me how, who else could play that? You know what I mean? Like, thanks for the offer, but I don't think it's appropriate because it's, it's not, um, in my opinion. And like with Superstore, why I watched it is because I found the article of the guy, uh, Colton Dunn, who plays, um, well, shoot, I just finished Garrett, who's in a wheelchair. He's not in a wheelchair, but he um and they like audition people in wheelchairs but he went to the writer's room he said I don't want this character to be like the disabled character he's a guy he's whatever he just happens to be in a chair it's not here's your token disabled and I was like I can watch the show now like that's oh. how you okay like that I felt comfortable watching it because he went like this is not about disabilities it's like okay don't love that you're able-bodied but love that you kind of went here's what I want and they listen. But yeah, I just, that's, that's kind of my thing is I also think it's responsibility of the actor. Uh, related to that, that uh, um, representation topic that Morgan brought up, can we please stop writing disability that is like a nameless disability so that you can make up traits as you go? Because it's really obvious <laughs> when you do that. Like if you have a character who is disabled and also silent, we know what you're doing. <laughs> Like that's not, it's not a good look. Can we just not do that anymore? Thanks, that'd be great. <laughs> like be super specific um, and be someone, truthful to it. Well, someone, I, I think a whole bunch of people, uh, a whole bunch of people, specifically autistic people had seen themselves 
in Sheldon Cooper in the Big Bang. And you could have just embraced that. They could have been like, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, lean into that because that's a huge audience. And instead they went, no, 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 he's not autistic. No, I don't know what you're talking about. And um, like, you know, the fact that you don't even want to identify with us is a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird. Oh, and I didn't a whole even lot know. Of analysts. Yeah, so that was a thing that happened. And it happens fairly frequently where like a character will have either, either you get one side, which is the Sheldon Cooper side where somebody is modeling this character after someone they knew that they did not know had a disability. And so obviously, no, 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 I'm not touching that. I'm not trying to offend anybody. It's not, they're not disabled, obviously. And, or you get the opposite side, which is somebody's making up a disability so that they can tell a disabled story that doesn't have to be accurate and doesn't have to be, and like, both uh, of those are kind of the side of the same point. And I would like that to stop, please. <laughs> <laughs> Best Foot Forward, hilarious kids show on Apple Plus did a lot right with representation from hiring PAs with disabilities to over half their writer's room. Oh, that's fantastic. And having an access coordinator on set. Are there any solutions that we can propose um, besides be being, we propose being better human beings <laughs> and like not singling people out and not forcing them to advocate for themselves uh, in the writer's room and uh, maybe opening up access to the writer's room. Are, are there any other solutions that we can think of? Uh, how is the CBC access program, by the way? I don't know how much you're allowed to talk about it because you're in it, but um, uh, that is a very specific program for people with disabilities, for writers with disabilities, creating shows, which I think is kind of awesome because <laughs> we're hearing from voices that we haven't heard from before in the industry. Um, and anything like that, any other ideas for solutions? Yeah, CBC Access was created because of the statistic that I was talking about, right? Okay. And um, there were two streams, and one of those streams was uh, for pitching your pilot, which obviously I applied to, and the other one was um, for making a documentary, and I... <laughs> And I was like, you know, we as a group or, you know, as writers, but also as people with disabilities, you know, we come across opportunities like this um, very, uh, not often. <laughs> so I applied to both streams. I, I, I made up an idea to make a documentary and it turned out um, to be one of the best things I've ever done. Um, and, uh, yeah, and they're not sure if they're going to do it again, but if they do, um, those of you out there, you should definitely, uh, try and get into that. Um, as far as being inspiring and, uh, doing something good. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I met this girl last summer and she was going to be featured in my movie because I asked her, she is also deaf and she was working in the liquor store. I walked in there to buy some beer and I was like, can I ask you something? Like, I have such a hard time with this. How do you work? Like, how, how do you deal with people? who are rude to you because you can't hear them because she told me she was deaf, right? And she was just like, fuck them. <laughs> Our give a damn needs to be busted because of all the barriers that are already in the film industry for women and older people and all the things, like all of the things. Uh, it's already, you kind of need that, you know, fuck them kind of attitude in, in terms of just your give a damn's busted. But but we still have to be vulnerable as writers. It's it's a part and parcel of being a writer and an actor is we have to be vulnerable. Like I can't shut that part off of me. So how, you know, how, how can you navigate that? It's so, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, it's hard. It's a hard thing to navigate. Right now there is, and I, I know this because I work in employment training as well as, as writing and creating, but over across the board, there is an idea that you hire disabled people because it is the right thing to do. And we really need to shift that. No, you should hire disabled people because we are really great problem solvers because yeah. we're doing it every day. Um, 
because we, you know, we are give a damn busted years ago because it had to do that in primary school. <laughs> uh, you know, all of that stuff is why you hire disabled folks. And also some of us are really super talented and have really cool ideas and you should hire us anyway. But like, there is an idea that hiring a disabled person is accepting a loss. Right. It's just not, that is not the case. You are getting so much that yeah. um, I think is particularly useful in this industry. So I think in terms of like, how do you make the writing room more accessible? Shift your thinking first. And secondly, uh, access and inclusion means like everybody, which means that like, if I can only work a 10 hour day, you can only have 12 hour days and that's better, that's healthier for everybody's mental health. <laughs> yes. Uh, if, if there are rooms that are big enough that a wheelchair can come in, everybody gets more space. <sighs> you know, those kind of things. We have to stop thinking of it as like, what can I add on to make life easier for this one disabled person? And think about like uh, 20 to 25% of us are going to be disabled in some way but also there's all this other stuff going on what makes it easier for everybody we're woken up now as an industry but we are aware of the issues we are aware of the statistics as an industry so i mean there's there's <laughs> There's so many issues that the in industry is addressing, or, uh, hopefully, but it's not universal. It's not unilateral. Some studios are addressing it. Some are not. So we're, some... we're in a really weird stage right now because um, classroom uh, mainstreaming happened in the 70s, and it was like the best thing that happened for people with disabilities since. So now we have a whole bunch of really educated, really talented disabled people who don't have access to, to jobs and opportunities because the, the places that they were set to go after their education finished are just not ready to be accessible. So the industry is in a, in a stage where they're like gathering data for how do we make it accessible for all of these stories. And meanwhile, the, the talented and uh, well-trained creatives with disabilities are going we've been waiting for the last 30 years could you catch up please <laughs> and meanwhile there's there's not really any laws like i mean there's laws against being able to provide accommodate like not being able to provide accommodations after you've hired a disabled person and the result of that is that people are is not that people don't uh, you know they'll, they'll put out feelers and then they're afraid to hire us because if they can't meet our accommodations, then they will get in trouble, which is why I said, please stop being afraid of getting sued and just talk to people. <laughs> yeah, read, read people. You know, I like this whole concept of blind reads where you don't know the writer's name uh, <laughs> and you just read the script and go, okay, how's the talent, you know? Um, uh, because that's that would seem like the most fair thing to do, uh, where you don't have the context of anything but the actual words on the page. Thank you so much. Uh, if you guys are interested in reading Ali Turcote, Morgan Fry, and uh, Veronica Swartz, they are actually uh, accomplished writers. They've, they're all got stuff in progress. You're going to see Morgan on uh, television soon in a new reality show. Um, Ali is one of my superstar story editors. Veronica is always writing something interesting and interesting, and her documentary will also be coming out this year. So, uh, which is called "I Can't Hear You Laughing," right? <laughs> <laughs> um so thank you so much everyone uh please uh, like and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more content like this i'd like to see more content like this i'm going to keep um uh, doing the work to find out more about my wonderful wonderful students uh the writers and the performers and the directors in my life um have can i just say something danielle before you go absolutely I, I i you know just for everybody watching i know we're angry we're tired um but things happen things are happening and uh we didn't get too much into that but things are happening <laughs> like in a good way you're saying things are happening in a good way i hope so i hope i hope they are and i hope they continue to and grow and uh yeah looking forward to seeing all your scripts come to life thanks everyone